hundred million dollar contract, gentlemen. So Brian and I discussed this. Brian and I were trying to go through thinking teams that have been bad lately, that haven't given out a max contract lately. We settled on the Detroit Pistons as our final answer. We'll and you right. would be wrong. The Chicago oh. Bulls. Wow. That is stunning. <laughs> look at him. Look at him. Hembo. Hembo Not so arrogant so today, I see. Hembo deserves Hembo, big Hembo time credit. Hembo was just mad that I, I was nervous I was just going to be wrong yesterday. Wow. Man, well, you Hembo can, was upset. Look, he got you back in a big way. Back. That's a good one. Wow. Ooh. Chicago Bulls. You can make a lot of jokes about the Chicago Bulls like about 100 million. Yeah. <laughs> Don't go there. Don't go there. They're about okay. to, though. They're about to. They the about to. They're going to skip that. over. That's true. Wait, that's can I get to this talk? They're about to skip this is over. The day. They're about to skip over 100 and give Zach Levine 200. 200. That's there right. you go. Skip the there you go. Man, Eight hours, 29 minutes wow. and counting till NBA free agency begins. Tim, you've got your fundamental list of the top five teams heading into free agency. Yeah, so let's, let's start with the Memphis Grizzlies, the most exciting young team in the league. We talked earlier about John Morant, who we see right here. He's going to get his own 200 million or a very large extension today. Grizzlies probably going to be one of the teams to look at in the years to come. Very excited about their future. They're fifth on my list of teams in the league um, going into this offseason. Next up on the list, the Los Angeles Clippers, the team that uh, is going into the season, to me, might be the championship favorites when you look at having mm. Paul George and Kawhi Leonard back Spice. and all of the depth they have around this team after Steve Ballmer, another guy who's not afraid to spend money, mm -hmm. has been just throwing out dollars left and right to bring in players over the past few months while the Clippers were not in contention this year. I think they have a chance to be a very, very good team next season. Third, the Milwaukee Bucks. Should have won a second straight championship this year. Chris Middleton had not gotten hurt in the second round, I think, or in the first round, I should say. I think they would have beat the Boston Celtics. Giannis Antetokounmpo had one of the great playoff series you'll ever see against Boston. Almost won it by himself. I think they go into next season, to me, as the team in the East that I would look at as the best, the most likely champion to come out of here. Second up, though, are the team that won the East last year, the Boston Celtics. Have to give them credit for the way they went through the playoffs. Jason Tatum had a pretty rough NBA Finals, as we all know. I think he will come back better. He, to me, is a sneaky pick for MVP this season because I think the Celtics have a chance to win a ton of regular season games. They have a young, durable roster. Emi Odoka has done a great job as coach, and I think they're going to be a very formidable foe this year. But the top team has to be the Golden State Warriors. Mm -hmm. I don't like the Warriors to repeat. I do think they're going to have some issues potentially with injuries as these guys get into their mid-30s. But when you look at them coming off the championship, Steph Curry having a truly incandescent performance in the finals, establishing himself again as one of the top players in the league, you have to give them the top spot until somebody takes them down. All right. I give you, I, look, it's a great list. I didn't see the Sixers, but that's okay. Uh, look, you know what? They got a shot. Okay. They got a they shot. Might, they honorable mention. We'll give them that. Because remember, it's going into free agency, and they're going to be a lot better in a couple of days, I think. Well, I, I will say that what I saw from Giannis in that playoff series, uh -huh. like seven-game series I covered, it's as great of a performance as I've seen in a series. And I, it's right there with LeBron stuff. The Bucks are in great shape going forward. You, okay. If you talk about the Bucks, you cannot. You're not going to potentially be right. They have the okay, best player well, in the universe. That's a good place to start. Well, I'll tell you what. If you're talking about the Warriors and their chances going forward, Draymond Green, we know what he thinks. And look at this bold prediction he made earlier this week. 19 was when Steph really locked in on the weight room, and so that's where he kind of starts taking that bump and and and, and kind of bumping it up a little bit. I think you started to see it then, that growth, and like, oh, man, nobody can stop this dude now. And I think that really changed the complexity of our organization, and I'm pretty certain that's why we'll win three of the next four NBA championships. Wow. Three of four? Do listen, you agree with Draymond? Listen, listen, the only surprise here was that Draymond didn't say, we're winning the next four championships. I'm really not <laughs> sure why he gave anyone any of them. I'll tell you why. So that if they don't win next year, he can say, I said three of the That's next right. four. That's right. <laughs> now, listen, I, I mean. Well, do you agree with him? No. I mean, I mean, I agree with him in the sense that the last six years that their core has been healthy, Draymond Green, Klay Thompson, Steph Curry, the Warriors made the NBA Finals, right? So, of course, Draymond's going to think we can win every year. Why wouldn't he? They just won the championship this year, right? But you look at the combination of age, injury, and competition, I just think it's going to be very difficult for Golden State to win one more, let alone three of the next four. Because you, you look at the teams around them, right? Just look at the West. You've got Memphis coming up, obviously giving them a ton of trouble in the second round this year. You've got the Clippers who are going to be coming. You have Denver who's going to be healthy this year. You've got Dallas and Luka Doncic. 
you got Phoenix. We'll see what they look like after last year. They're, that's just in the West. We just got done talking about the Bucks, the Celtics, the Nets, the Sixers. There's a ton of really good teams. So you need to not only be good, you also have to be lucky. These guys are in their mid-30s, ton of miles on their tires. They've all had injuries. I just think it's hard to count on. And then Wendy can have a shot. And then Wendy can the, can the Warriors keep this team together? They can, and they will. You know, it's been ten years now that these three guys, you know, Curry, Clay, and Draymond have been together. That's very rare in the NBA. You what know, the reasons? Bulls might not have given out a hundred million dollar contract. The Warriors are giving out hundred million dollars just left and right. right. For the rest <laughs> but of the one year. of the reasons why it's hard to keep guys. First off, it's hard to get guys to stay together just personally. There's personal issues that come in mm-hmm. and teams break apart. The other thing is the teams become too expensive, and the Warriors ownership. And it's, it's coincided with their move to San Francisco in a money machine arena. And also that their owners are, their owners were willing to sell off 5% of the team. They sold 5% of the team a year ago to help pay for this run. Wow. That is something that should not be ignored. Okay. And I, I know that we, it's not fun to talk about the, the billionaires in this, but I can't think of too many teams in history that would sell off a piece of the equity that they could never get back to pay for this run. And because they did this, they're going to be able to continue to expend $300 million a year. There's even potential that it will be over $400 million next year. Oh, and maybe goodness. in the short-term future, even at $500 million, um, you know, in, in, including the luxury tax in the future. So the fact that they are willing to do that and the fact that they also, while they were on that sort of two-year hiatus while Clay and, and, and Steph were dealing with injuries, they just got three lottery picks over the last two years. You know that those guys are going to help refresh the group. Jordan Poole, who was not a lottery pick, is going to refresh the group. They really, for as much as we make fun and everybody has fun at the expense of the light years comment, they really have been able to extend the window of this group in a way that we really haven't seen in the modern era. Wow, and the numbers just keep going up and up. 500 million brought to you by Chase. What a day it is here on Get Up because we begin the hour with the biggest story of the day. Check out the countdown clock. T minus nine hours to go until the free agent frenzy begins in the NBA. And we start with woes bombs involving all stars beginning with a blockbuster trade last night. All-star guard DeJounte Murray heading to Atlanta to team up with Trey Young. The Hawks are sending Danilo Gallinari and three first-rounders back to San Antonio. Meanwhile, three-time All-Star Bradley Beal is now an unrestricted free agent after declining his option for next season. He could sign a max deal for five years, $250 million if he stays in D.C. Lastly, 10-time All-Star James Harden declines his $47.3 million option with the Sixers. He's now an unrestricted free agent. And here's woes from earlier about why Harden opted out. Really an attempt by Harden uh, to try to give Philadelphia the tools to go out and improve this Sixers team. It allows them to use their full mid-level exception at $10.5 million, uh, a biannual exception that starts at $4 million, and, and also make some trades. But what Harden has really uh, talked to the Sixers about was trying to do what he could uh, to allow Daryl Morey and Elton Brand and their front office to go out and surround he and Joel, Joel Embiid with the kind of players and, and the kind of toughness, physical toughness, mental toughness that they felt they lacked in the playoffs last year. Interesting. You know, Harden came into Philly when he came by trade. He talked about team first. Not a lot of people believed it at the time, but now maybe he's showing it. What do you make of these moves from Harden? One of the things that we see that is very difficult to deal with in the NBA is sometimes star players in their mid-30s who maybe don't recognize where it's transitioning with their game. This is James Harden, frankly, having some self-awareness. Now, you could argue that self-awareness comes from the reality that he wasn't a max player in the market anymore, and they didn't have teams that were going to offer it to him anyway, including Philadelphia. But I do give him credit for saying, okay, I, I need to make an adjustment in my game, which is most important, mm-hmm. and you make an adjustment in the way I approach this contract. And by doing this, even though he's still a guy who's going to be very highly paid, he's still a guy that is going to have high expectations, he's changing the narrative, and we know that in Philadelphia particularly, the narrative and how you're viewed can affect how you live your day-to-day life. And yes. you just asked Mr. Ben Simmons about that. And so I do think that Harden is doing some things here that potentially could really help the Sixers, not only with around him, but the way Harden is going to approach 
this phase of his career. Well, and it should be noted, too, after game six against Miami in the second round when they lost and their season ended in Philly at Wells Fargo Center for the second season in a row, mm -hmm. James Harden was asked about his contract status, and he said he was going to do whatever it took to make this team as good as possible going forward. He has backed that up today. He now has to back it up on the court next season. But this is a significant thing, taking less money now so they can use these extra exceptions they have to make the team better and go into next season with the best chance they have to I'm win. I'm really impressed by him. He put his money where his mouth is, and that's what Philadelphia fans want. They want players who not only want to be there, who want to win, but actually when they say they're going to do something, they do something. Now, there's still the issue, Brian, of how much money he actually gives up. How do you see that playing out? Based on the projections of what it's going to take to trigger those exceptions, I think he's going to be giving up eight figures just in this season alone. Mm. So I think wow. he'll, he'll drop from 47 million that he could have got with his with his uh, with his option to back into the mid 30s. Now he will guarantee tens of millions over the course of a multi-year contract. Again, let's not lay awake tonight and worry about James Harden. <laughs> and we should also point out, this isn't James Harden walking away from a max contract to take less money. James Harden was not going to get a max contract. So really what this is, rather than taking away money he was going to get, it's really reallocating money he was going to get over a period of time. But, but he didn't have to No, no, it's not this to year. diminish the, what, the impact on this season, mm -hmm. but I think it's also important to note that this isn't him necessarily taking a massive haircut from what he was overall going to get. It's just spreading it out in a different way that allows the Sixers to be much better now. I think what's interesting, though, is how many superstars do you see, and touching on your point, doing something like this? Does it show you that he's more focused on winning in terms of winning a title than he ever has been. I think it goes back to what you said before about putting his money where his mouth was. When he said that after that game back in May, there were a lot of people who heard it and took it a different way. Like, oh, what, you know, what exactly is that going to mean in terms mm -hmm. of what he's going to do? I took it at the time as him saying, if I need to take less money for us to be in a good place to win, that's what I'm going to do. To your point, that isn't always something he's necessarily been known to do. The fact that he did it now, I do think it's a significant thing, especially because it gives them a chance to get P.J. Tucker, exactly the kind of guy that they need to get, assuming they can get that signing done. They went and got the Anthony Melton last week. They're adding the kind of pieces around Tyrese Maxey, Joel Embiid, and James Harden that this team needs to be a real contender in the East, and I think they're on the path to doing that. Now, Embiid and James Harden, that this team needs to be a real contender in the East, and I think they're on the path to doing that. Now, he's doing it at a time when guys like Russell Westbrook aren't doing it, which is, that's not to knock Russell Westbrook. I wouldn't do it right. in many ways, but still. If, if at, open, at the opening of free agency a year ago, which was actually in August, not July because of the calendar, you had told James Harden that he was going to be doing this now, mm -hmm. He wouldn't have believed you. <laughs> if you'd have told him he was doing this now with the Sixers, he wouldn't have believed you. But he has, re he has reacted to those changes by being adaptive. And so for that, in this era where we don't see that, he deserves a measure of credit. He really does. I give him some credit. And we'll see where this goes in terms of who the Sixers bring in and whether or not that can actually lead to a title, which is what people in Philly really want. And you know what they want in Brooklyn? They want a title, too. And